it came more from, you know, the Hellraiser, Rabble Rouser political side, and then John showed up. And John, you know, I love John so much, oh my God. And we talked about issues with the environment and connected them to political consciousness. And I want to start kind of with John. Because one of the things that John and I talked about, we did a series of these, a series of radio shows in 2010 about the crisis in the Gulf. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about Corexit, and we're talking about all this stuff. Nobody pays attention to us. It's like it was just going to be, like, non-existent. And he said, you know, hey, there's some issues here, some serious issues. But, but John's level of understanding is supersedes mine quite dramatically because he has a much stronger grounding in, in what's really going on with the oceans, and that's his world. And so you would think, after all the stuff that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, that the last thing that people want to do is start a bunch of drilling in the, in the ocean. But evidently, that's not the last thing you want to do. So I'm going to start off this evening talking about the Atlantic Ocean and oil wells. And what do you all think? So, John, you're probably more conversant with this than anybody. What's happening in that world right now? Well, right now, uh, I mean, here recently, you know, within the past, what, 30 to 45 days, um, they have opened up parts of the Atlantic and the Arctic to potential leasing for drilling, which also includes, you know, the exploratory part where you hear about um, an issue called seismic air gun testing. Um Quite frankly, seismic air gun testing is basically loud explosions taken off underwater that is going to um, have a serious negative impact, you know, on marine mammals and, you know, and not just marine mammals, but the marine life in general. You know, just that noise, um, especially on the east coast right now, where you have the critically endangered uh, North Atlantic right whales. Uh, that's a huge bone of contention. And, and, you know, you, you look up into the Arctic, you know, that kind of speaks for itself again. You know, you have all the critically endangered, you know, you stellar sea lions, you know, you it's endangered species after endangered species. And why would you want to open this up? But the, in the Arctic, you're looking at what if a spill happens in the Arctic, like happened in the Gulf. Um, you know, the, the colder waters, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the pictures this past week. Have you seen the sludge pictures from the waves there in Nantucket? Yeah, like they're like the slurpy pictures, right? Yeah, okay. So now you're going to be looking at waters that are going to have this sludge consistency, you know, in much of the region. You know, you're talking the Arctic here, you know, and this is what we've seen on the East Coast with these pictures. Everybody's like, well, these pictures are great. Well, now add oil to that. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be devastating um, because... If it happens there, um, you know, if it happens on the the Atlantic, look at the Chesapeake Bay, which is already under an enormous amount of um, pollution pressure, human-induced pollution pressure from runoff from all the farm areas, uh, you know, warming oceans, you know, the, the uh, pH levels are lowering, causing, acid, you know, acidity to rise in these regions, which has impacted shellfish. I meaning mussels, clams, oysters, and what do they do? They filter the water, so now they can't clean the water. So it's just this whole um, tropic cascade. It's just one thing after another. And, Andrew, if you go back to where we talked about uh, one of the original shows we did about the Deepwater Horizon, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, where we talked about the chemical changes and the long-term effects, and no matter how... They try to spin it in the mass media conception. You know, just yesterday, in, you know, recent studies, i.e., the, the the dolphin deaths alone, you know, have multiplied exponentially each year. Uh, they're seeing mass strandings and deaths, and you're seeing the growth of <clears throat> all these different viruses, and viruses are multiplying. Well, let's think about the, the toxic soup we've created there. Um, you know, the Gulf is just a mess, and it, it, we talked about Valdez and how it, Valdez, you know, all these years and decades later, is still not the same. The Gulf isn't going to be the same. Now we're opening up the Atlantic. 
which if a spill like that happens, the impact is going to have on the Chesapeake Bay, the other estuaries, not to mention up in New England, up in, you know, right in Ron's area, you know, you have this massive effort right now uh, to reestablish oyster beds, which, you know, I commend, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, that's something that needs to be done, and now you're going to open it up to potential drilling. It's just, it's, <laughs> to me, I just don't understand why they don't take the scientific, you know, every every scientist, it, the data is out there, they're telling them, this is bad. You even have fishermen, you have commercial fishermen telling them on the East Coast, this is a bad thing to do. You know, and, and part of these drilling areas are even in protected areas, which is just grossly irresponsible of, you know, you know, the, the administration, you know, boils down to government. Um, on the political side of it, which you guys are much more well-versed, I think it's all just a big trade-off. I think they got the, the, the veto on the Keystone XL, and this is a trade-off. And again, it's not just the environment that's going to lose here, and it's not just wildlife that's going to lose here. Coastal communities could be devastated, and they will be devastated, um, because many of these issues, they're connected, so... You know, I hope that's a good little, um, how do I put it, brief synopsis of what's going on, you know, in these two regions right now. And uh, I'm actually um, going to be doing a show that's not even scheduled yet, Wednesday morning, with a group from the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is a national organization, and the Assateek, um Coastal Trust, um, who will be attending in March, March 9th in Annapolis, one of the public hearings. So we're putting together a show about that Wednesday morning. So we're going to be getting into that much detail and sharing some really good um, graphics and other things like that. We um, we have pictures and uh, infographics done of what would happen if an oil spill the size of Deepwater Horizon happened off the coast of Virginia and what, how it would impact the, um, the um, Chesapeake Bay and such. So, there's going to be much more information coming out about this. And I know in organizations like Surf Rider and the National Resources Defense Council, and the Center for Biological Diversity, everybody's really pulling together. And Oceana, you know, in my organization, and I'm a part of Fins and Fluke and a board member there. I mean, a lot of people from many walks of lives, including, like I said, the commercial fishermen, which is huge. So hopefully that helped a little bit. You know, Don't you find it fascinating? I mean, don't you find it fascinating that there's such a push to deny all the evidence? I mean, it's obviously economically motivated. I mean, it's obvious that, that you know, the oil companies, whoever is, is making money, is trying to deny all this information. I mean, that's an ongoing thing we talk about forever, and certainly Yost well, talks about this all the time, too. I think one of the great, one of the great things that I've, I've seen over the past couple of days, I haven't even read the article or read with this, um, political official was done, but I saw I saw her read briefly. Um, the political official, I guess, stood on the floor of the House of the Senate, wherever it was, with a snowball. I guess basically saying how you know global warming doesn't exist because I have a snowball. Well, who are you going to believe? You know, some politician who's in the pocket of some you know, lobbyist for an oil company. Or are you going to believe the thousands and thousands of scientists sitting over here saying it's a bad idea? You know, global warming is, uh, you know, it's, to me, it's just ludicrous. You know, and on the flip side, with the uncertainty, you know, with global warming, with ocean acidification, they're all connected, and there's one common denominator, CO2. Well, where's the CO2 come? It comes from burning fossil fuels. So now we're going to burn more fuel. We're going to add to a problem that we're already dealing with on a global basis. As we speak, there's a group of Native Alaskans, Eskimos that over the past couple weeks have been identified that they are going to be relocated off of their island due to sea level rise. What's causing that? All the issues I just mentioned. And yeah, we talked about this in 2007 and 2008. I mean, it's a common theme, and Yost probably said the same thing in the same time frame. But but even before you showed up with with Ron and me, we both talked about this. You know, early on, I mean, it's, to me, it's inevitable. Uh, Ron, when you look at when you look at what's going on politically, I mean, 
and you've watched this pretty closely for all these years and are involved with it so intimately. Compared to when you and I started doing the shows together, was that 2007? What do you think's going on as far as you think it's better or worse than it was back then? Well, I, excuse me. I think I, environmentally we're definitely worse, right? Um, but politically, uh, we're we are in the in the same, if not worse, position because um, you know there used to be a difference between the parties that. You can discern a little bit more, but right now it's basically, you know, the the fringe right or the fringe left, and everybody in the middle is bought bought and paid for. So it's really difficult uh, on on a national political level. But if you look at all the wonderful things that are happening locally around the country, I think that there is that awakening that we talked about back in 2007, 2008. Uh, you specifically, I mean, I remember a lot of your predictions have come true, and there's a lot of people that are waking up. Unfortunately, there's still way too many people sleeping. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, and John confronts this all the time. I mean, as more people wake up, because I believe that there are, mm -hmm. then the push to deny the things they're waking up to becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, that's the climate deniers, the you know, all the legislation, you know, trying to get scientists out of the EPA. I mean, all those things are, in one sense, you could say last-ditch efforts. Uh, I want to bring Dr. Van Dyke in for a second, because, mm -hmm. so yes, when you look at this process, and you see how the anti-intellectualism of corporate interests, how they're really trying to deny, as John talked about, all the scientific evidence, all the anecdotal evidence from people that are actually working in those fields because they don't want to lose their cash cow. When, when you talk with people and the things that you write about, do you see, I mean, so my question is, from a trend line, how do you see the dial moving? Do you think it's moving, we're getting progressively stronger, you know, that we're waking up more, or do you think it's kind of regressing? Um, well, I do think we're, we're, um, we're coming to a critical mass um, where... You know, with with the Internet being the way it is, I mean, there's so much information coming at us. Um, and the thing about it is that with all the information that's coming at us, you know, it's it's there's also the the um, the conflict is how do we discern what's truth and what's not. Um, but before I go on, I have to, pursuant to what John was talking about with the Atlantic Ocean, and I don't mean to jump around, but I just I feel like I have to make this point because I feel like it's very important. But to me, not only are they opening up the Atlantic Ocean, but I don't understand why, whether whether it was scientifically motivated within the EPA or not, but I don't understand why the EPA has granted BP prime Gulf real estate and drilling rights in the Gulf of Mexico again. To me, that is, it's just absolutely reprehensible, and I don't understand um, where the motivation is. So the fact that I bring that up, I don't know if we're, um, if we're reaching a critical mass where people are becoming more enlightened because the fact that something like this is happening after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon catastrophe, why there's not more people around the country outraged uh, with, um, with the EPA allowance of BP back in the Gulf of Mexico again. I don't know. I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like the old joke about the actress who's a, you know, method actress, 
or method actor, you know, they're trying to do Stanislavski and trying to understand their motivation. What's my motivation to do any this particular thing? And the director, 